decided as I looked forward into uh, uh, this year, 2024, I'm going to do some preaching out of the Old Testament. And if you'll notice, most of my sermons are from the New Testament. And uh, I've decided that I'm going to do some speaking in the book of Genesis. And uh, some parts of Genesis are very familiar to you, some are not. And the Bible does not answer every question you have. It doesn't tell you everything. And some days when you read it, when you get done, you've got more questions in your mind you hadn't thought about until you did read it. But God doesn't connect all the dots. What he does do, it tells you enough that we know how to live the Christian life. And we know how to be obedient. What gets us in trouble as a people is not what we do not know. What we do know. What you do not know doesn't hurt you, in many cases. But what you do know, God holds you accountable for. And uh, the purpose of our personal devotions, Bible study sermons, is there to inform us and teach us what God's Word has to say. Sometimes the familiar is comfortable. I uh, I'm not a Catholic, but every once in a while I've attended Catholic masses. For one reason or other. Usually it's because of somebody else that I know that that particular service is either they're participating in or it's on their behalf. And one of the comforting things of their services is the predictability of what they're going to pray, what they're going to say, and how they're going to worship. There's comfort in tradition. Now, you say, well, that's a Catholic way of doing it. Why are you talking that way? Well, Jesus talked to the Jewish people that way. He told them they were to memorize the Ten Commandments. They were to take a nail, something on the side of the door of their house, so that as they go in and go out there and they glance over there, it helps them remember God's Word. They were told to repeat it, study it, say it during the week. That's repetitive learning until it becomes part of you. So there's nothing wrong with repetition, nothing wrong with that which is familiar. But in the midst of it, what I find that even when you deal with the familiar, the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and give you something new. And I'm a strong believer in the two sermons that are preached every Sunday. The one the pastor gives you and the one the Holy Spirit gives you. Because sometimes in the middle of what is being said and done, the Holy Spirit begins to deal with you. And I don't even know what he's saying to you. I don't need to know. That's between you and God. But the Holy Spirit is here today to bless your spirit, bless your mind, and to draw you to Himself. Some of what I'm going to read to you today is going to be familiar, and I'm not going to spend all my time in this part of the Bible, but it is going to be familiar. And so if you want to turn with me to page 1. If you're using a Bible from the pew, page 1. Top of the page is going to say Genesis. It's going to be the beginning of what God had to say about the creation of this world. Now, there's something that all of us are used to, not in the religious world, but in the civil world. One of the things is who are you? Where'd you come from? And what do you know? 
And then according to our prejudices, we then decide whether you are not you're an okay person. If you come from the wrong part of town, the wrong side of the tracks, the wrong nationality, yeah, well, man, you're not as good as we are. Isn't that the way it is? Honestly? In connection to the right people, you live in the right neighborhood, you have a good beginning, doesn't mean you're going to turn out good, but it does say where you started from. Now, in the Bible, God does not tell us everything we wish he did. There's a huge gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Big gap. I don't know if that gap is in days, hours, thousands of years. I don't know. I have no question in my mind that God is the creator of everything that's out there. I believe that with my whole heart. In the beginning, God. But as he begins to tell you what he did, the wheels start turning in your head and say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's he saying to us here? Did God find something that had no use, that burnt out, had no life-sustaining capabilities, and out of that make the world that we have? You say, well, that's a remake, that's not creation. Well, he made, he made the original planet that he's dealing with. Now, whether or not he made that planet at the beginning of his week of creation, or he had made it earlier for some other purpose, and then allowed it to be destroyed to the point it could not sustain life, had no value, there was no light, it was in absolute darkness, and useless. I don't know what happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. You got some answers to that, I'm ready to listen to you. Because I'm sure there's many theories, many reasons. But it doesn't make a difference as to whether or not you're a Christian today, or whether or not you'll make it to heaven. When I get to heaven, I got a lot of questions I want to ask. Because over the years, I've tried to connect dots and make a picture and understand what God was saying. And I didn't always, wasn't always able to connect all of the dots. Did that change my faith? No. I can like you without knowing everything about you. In fact, the truth is known, I know there's, I know, let me say this right, there's more that I don't know about you than that I do. But what I do know, I like. Make sense? Maybe if you knew more about me, you wouldn't like me. Well, you say, well, Pastor, what we're doing about you, we don't like. <laughs> that could be true. One thing I do know is God has not made us perfect. He may have made the human race perfect in the beginning, but you and I individually, where we are in life, who we are, none of us are perfect. But in spite of our imperfections and our shortcomings and our misjudgments, God loves us. Loves us so much that in John 3.16, he sent his only begotten Son. But whosoever believeth on him should not perish. I'm not talking about this life. We all will experience the death of this life. <clears throat> Nobody gets out alive. But on the other side, there's eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. He didn't say I can do it. He didn't just say there is one. He said, I am the resurrection. Well, 
between Genesis 1 and John 1, you get the impression that Jesus was the person that the Godhead who spoke this world into existence. And it was Jesus who came and laid his life down, took the life of human, as well as being God, and all of its limitations, that he could be a sacrifice for the race that he had committed, created. How many fathers and mothers would give anything to their children to give them what they need? And you don't think about it twice. It's a compulsion. That is, if you're normal, it is. We have some parents that don't have parental feelings. But those who are normal, there's compulsions that you have, and no matter how old you are, if you became a father, you never cease being a father. And if you became a mother, you never stop being a mother. No matter how old you are, or how old your children are. And so we have a picture here in Genesis that God gives us an insight into where we came from and out of that should form a foundation that starts to make the rest of the Bible make sense. Now as you read the story of Genesis, God does not answer every one of your questions. In the first five chapters of Genesis, I bet you could write a whole page full of questions that you don't have answered. What about this? What about that? Where'd this one come from? Where'd that one come from? What happened? How did God connect the dots here? Well, he told us what we need to know. The book was written by Moses, and he, he gave us what we need to know. In chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens, which is plural. And say he created heaven. He created the heavens. And you can go take all the translations you want to read from, every one of them, heaven is plural. Every translation. You say, why do you say it that way? Well, English is not the language that the Bible was written in. Sometimes in the transition from Hebrew or Arabic, you lose something. The words that we don't have in English. English is not the most expressive language. There's other languages that tell more according to which word is used. So in the beginning, God created the heavens plural and the earth. Now that's not a recreation, that's creation. Something from nothing. I can't do that, but God can. Now the earth was formless and empty. That's about as void as a picture as you can paint. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, plural. So whatever was out there was dark, useless, lifeless, and covered in water. Okay? So between creation and where we find it at the end of verse 2, we don't know. Verse 3 says, and God said, let there be light. God is not the author of darkness, he's the author of light. And in the New Testament, we're told God is light. So wherever God is, he turns the bulb on. He doesn't run around in darkness in our lives. He turns the light on. He turns the light on in our lives and what we, what we do, what we think, what we feel. When you're around God, that's transparent. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. 
And so he separated the light from the darkness. That means he took the world and started it spinning. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And then there was evening and morning on the first day. Everything that God makes is good. Not full of defects. Perfect. God does not create imperfection. We do. I love to go down the Thame Street, down past Gary's restaurant, and it was a glass company. I used to sell oil to the people that owned the building and ran the business. But in there, there were people blowing glass. Not so much in the morning, but in the afternoon, you could look up on the second floor as you drove down Thames Street. You could see the ovens going, and they're getting the glass hot enough that somebody who knew how to blow on glass was shaping it. But what they made was not perfect. If you took a vertical and a horizontal line, you would find the guarantee that that was hand blown. It's a slight imperfection. That's part of what it meant made of knives. You got a hand blown piece of glassware in your house, it's beautiful. But it's not necessarily symmetrical. Made by man. What God made is perfect. So God said, let there be light. And that was the first day. Turn the light on. And in verse 6, God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. And so God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the vault sky. And there was evening and morning the second day. Now I don't understand what got said there. Do you? What's the vault? What vault? We, uh, in the Bible study, uh, Fred asked us a couple weeks ago, what's heaven? When you read about heaven, what, what do you think of this? What is it to you? Well, my answer was atmosphere. If there is not atmosphere around this world filled with oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide, you and I don't live. Everything that God has created that has breath needs the elements that are in the air. Only 21% of the air is oxygen. What's the rest of it? All the other elements. Without carbon, there's no life. We live in a generation that's trying to have a carbon-free footprint in industry and in commerce. Can't have a carbon be for carbon-free footprint or you won't live. Without carbon, there's no fire. Stand there with your lighter in front of the stove. Well, light it, there's no carbon. Nothing burns without carbon. You can't grow anything without carbon. The soil itself has to have carbon in it. Some of the land of, in our own country that has gone to drought, cracked open, absolute deep dryness, water gone forever. The farmers have tried to replant that land as soon as they got it wet. Well, grow anything. They've started buying carbon and injecting it into the soil just like other farmers would put fertilizer in the soil. Without carbon, nothing will grow. It's the essence of life and it's the essence of fire. A chemical change. God works with jets. You can't fire those engines without carbon. There's carbon in the fuel. What makes them run? And so here we have a picture here of God 
taken another step in the creative week that he had. And he separated the waters above the sky from the waters below the sky. I don't know what the waters are that are above the sky. Even with all the science we have, I don't know what that is. What I do know is when it snows, like it did last Sunday, you see snow come down, but snow goes up. The water from the ground has to go up and feed the clouds while it's snowing. That's crazy. That's a fact. Without the moisture from the ground going up, that's what the storm grabs. They come down in the form of snow. I used to live south, maybe southwest just a touch, from Lake Erie. I lived in northwest Ohio where I went to college. It's up there for seven years. When the conditions were right and the wind was right, boy did we get snow. You know why? There was plenty of moisture in Lake Erie. The storm would suck it up and then send it down in the form of snow. We had deep snow out there. Nothing unusual to see two foot, three foot of snow. Not like we have around here. We had an exciting day, shut everything down over five inches. We're not used to real snow like we used to have. The snow goes up as well as there. Then God decided to separate the water and the land. We're worried today that as the ice is melting in both the North Pole and the South Pole, that the level of the ocean is rising. We're worried about that. Manhattan, Long Island, the winter water. We have waters that will not, rivers that will not empty themselves into the ocean because the water's too high. I remember one of the hurricanes we had here in Newport. The water flowed up the bay and up the river and shipped down the river and up to the ocean. And with it came all the ground up sewage. It had been dumped by the sewer plants, but the inbound tide, even though the pipe went way out there, eventually picked it up, brought it in, and you could walk on people's cellars after the water was gone and see it on their walls. It looked like tobacco on their walls, and you had a slight scent in the air. I walked in people's cellars because their furnace was around and had to be put together. If they were gas, they had to be replaced. If they were oil, they were rebuildable. And when I got the scent of sewage in the cellar, I walked back upstairs and said, you get a clean company down there, clean the cellar up, and then I'll come back. I'm not going to read that. It was not healthy. The rivers. We're worried about the rivers today, but God divided in creation and separated land from rivers and the land is what we lived on. And he put it all together. In verse 7, God started the first growth on the earth. He said, let there be vegetation. You know, no matter who you are in life, no matter what your discipline of education is, but no matter what you do for a living, you read this passage of Scripture differently. You say, what do you mean? Well, if you were an astrologist, you paid attention to when God hung the sun and the moon and put the stars up there. As God says, the stars will be there to tell you things that are going on. The wise men read the stars and announced the birth of Jesus Christ. I'm not an astrologer. But those who study it say that the location of the stars tells you something. There's astronauts 
I want to fly through the sky. Pretty fast. Faster than an airplane. And get out beyond what you and I consider sky and the atmosphere that we can survive in. And they want to go out into space so they can see what's out there. What's on the moon? What's on Mars? Can they sustain life? No, God didn't decide that that was what he wanted them for. Life is on Earth. If you were a physicist, you'd start looking at all the chemicals that God put in the Earth. He didn't just put soil there. He put minerals. 96 of them. Some of them are valuable. Some of them are essential to life. Some we've realized we can use to make ourselves feel better. A physicist studies the relationship of chemicals. A medical physicist studies what chemicals affect your body and how those chemicals react within you. A medical physicist is the one who designed radiation, chemotherapy and all the cures that are out there for cancer. The relationship between the minerals that God has created and the human body. Biologist studies the plants. And then we have those who study aquaculture. They go in the ocean and under the ocean with diving suits and see what's growing down there. There's a whole world down there that you and I don't see. And it's filled with fish. Some are nice and some are like lions that eat you. And so you have to pay attention to where you go swimming down there. Sometimes you have to put a cage around yourself. But some of these creatures, they want you. They'll eat you if they get a chance. God made them. I look at the farmers. We have dairy farmers that have cows that give us the milk that sustains life and the beef that does that. There are beef farmers who raise cows for that purpose and they spend most of their time growing crops that become feed for the animals. Everything they do out in the fields is to produce something to support the beef cow. And out of all the people that arise out of the story of creation, then the theologians, I put them at the bottom of the list. Theologians are the study of God. When a theologian reads the story of creation, he doesn't stay seated. He gets excited. He's doing hallelujah, praise the Lord. This is my God that has made all these things. And there's no conflict, no conflict between the Bible and real science. Science theory? Yes. Science theory, such as the theory of evolution, does not match the Bible. You may like to monkey around, but that's not where you came from. And as you read these first two chapters, you were made in the likeness and imagery of Almighty God. That creates a lot of reverence as to who you are, in my mind. God put in you something he didn't put in the rest of creation, soul. Because that soul is what he wants to see redeemed so he can spend eternity with you because atonement is get to get you back to where God started with with you in the beginning of creation that you had a holy heart and that you're a forgiven people and that you have the promise of eternal life God did all of that to get you back to how he made you in the Garden of Eden 
the beginning. God does not make junk. God does not make imperfection. We do. God doesn't. We were a perfect people. The earth was a perfect earth before sin. But in order to make us in his image, he had to give us choice. The ability to choose, to listen. The very first sin that was committed, I got more sermon material, but I'm not going to keep you beyond a normal time. That's my thought though. God made us in his image without sin. But he had to take the risk that we make the wrong choice. The first decision made by the human race, unfortunately, was made by Eve and approved by Adam. Was the question God? And when the serpent came up to Eve, he said, God didn't tell you the whole story. He said, you'll know more than you know now if you eat of the tree. Oh, yes, you will. If that happened to be the tree of good and evil, not the tree of life. The tree of good and evil meant that you would know evil, something you don't know now. All of us that are here are so excited when a baby is born into our family. And a baby comes with a gift from God that we take away from that baby with time. Innocence. That baby is born without as, as pure as driven snow before snow is contaminated. And so is it a little baby that is born. And in our educational system today, we are taking the innocence away from children. We're teaching them things that their young mind shouldn't even be dealing with. God gave us choice, and he still gives us choice. Today, you and I, we come here to worship, but when we leave here, we'll make decisions. We will choose. And the battleground of all of our lives is a battleground of faith. We do not have trouble usually with what God tells us as much as we have trouble with believing God. That's why Jesus with his disciples while he was here on earth. The most repetitive question that Jesus asked his own disciple, who do you say that I am? Your opinion of Jesus Christ is the most important decision about God that you can make. Is he God's only begotten son? And if he did, did he die for me? Can I put my faith in him? and trust him that I'll go to heaven? Can I listen to him and his word and test my decisions in life by God's word? Does it work? Is he true? Or is the Bible full of mistakes? I can take you scholars of language and put them in the room and they'll debate back and forth whether word A or word B sometimes is the best choice to use when going from Greek to English, or from Arabic to English, or Hebrew to English. Some days I sit down and I put the translations in front of me when I'm studying and getting ready for a service. I did it for this service. There were a few things in there about creation. I wanted to see what the words were of another translation. If there was any change. But even though there are different words that are used when it comes to English, the message is still the same. You can choose word A or word B, and one may be closer to the original than the other, 
And you can sit there and debate that all day if you want to. I've had nine years of language study as part of my preparation. Enough that I understand the challenge of going from one language to another in translating. And you can hold up the Bible you use and say this is the best one. The best one is the one you understand. We use NIV here at the church. Is that the best translation? Well, it's not literal. But it's world English. What's changed is not God's word, our language has changed. And so it's more current. We don't speak Shakespearean English, none of us do. And so we use more current English so that we understand what it's saying. As you read the creation story, and it gets more interesting as you keep on going, on the sixth day, God made man. He put everything in place before he made us. So that there was a world for Adam to come into. Adam was made from dirt. And us guys still like playing on the dirt. But we don't know why. After we're done playing on the dirt, take our hands and wipe them all over our hands. Why do boys do that? I don't know. Girls, you weren't made from the dust of the earth. You were made from the rib of Aaron, Adam, close to his heart. And when you were made, God said, hey Adam, you need a helper. And us guys, when we admit it, we don't like to admit it, but we need your girl's help as much now as we've ever needed it. You make our world complete. But the creation story, read it again. It never gets old, never gets tired, and never loses its scientific basis. The more we know about science, the more we believe in the Bible. Theor theoretical science, not so much. Because theoretical science doesn't start with God. The Bible starts with God, and this is what God made. That is where my faith stands today. Not a popular position. Today we are being people are being told in churches, I oh, just interpret the Bible as you want, it doesn't really mean what it says. Well yes it does. Don't skip over the parts you don't like. Creative story. God did not tell us everything. You can connect the dots and tell me what you think the connection is, and I'll sit there and listen to and enjoy every minute of talking to you. But there are some parts of the Bible that God on purpose did not connect the dots in his written word. We get to heaven, we'll find out why. But what he did do is he connected enough for us to know where we got started from as a human race and where this world came from. And if you read the whole Bible on the other end, it tells you where we're headed. And in between, we have a God that loves us and forgives us through the atonement. That's good enough for me. In the weeks ahead, we're going to take a look at Genesis. I'm not going to do an exhaustive study of the book of Genesis, but I'm going to look at the highlights of the book. And we'll share some things in there, and hopefully there'll be some things that'll bless your heart and add to your faith. Thank you for coming this morning.